Thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, great to be here. Welcome everyone. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen to start. Uh, hopefully you can all see that. Yes, yes, we can. Great. Okay. Um, so thanks to Johannes and Hannah for the invitation. Um, as uh, was just mentioned, I'm gonna speak about um, unlearning ecocide and try to add some, um, some critical thoughts to what that entails uh, and connect it to some uh, artistic practices as well. So uh, to learn from the earth, we must understand, we must unlearn uh, ecocide. Uh, that's no easy thing as we are all inhabitants of the planet subjected differentially to the ongoing terms of racial, colonial, and extractive capitalism. Uh, nevertheless, this unlearning emerges as a political imperative at the present time of climate breakdown, where global society, including diverse artistic cultures, face the collective challenge of transforming everything in order to ensure survival. So what are the terms of this unlearning and learning? And how can artistic practice aid the struggle? Well, there's lots to learn from the earth and the disciplines of the natural sciences, the environmental arts um, and the environmental humanities, including um, disciplines like multi-species ethnography, animal studies, agroecology, and so on, provide ever-growing insights. Uh, there's also traditional ecological knowledge emanating from diverse indigenous cultures subsistence farmer communities uh, and more that offer other important sources of insight of earth learning. Inspirational examples um, of such learning in the artistic context include um, Ursula Biman and Paolo Taveras's Forest Law, a double channel video that presents the struggle of the Seriaku and Shuar peoples in the Ecuadorian Amazon um, who are struggling against extractive corporations that transgress the newly enacted rights of nature in Ecuador's constitution and also longstanding indigenous cohabitants with their environments, um, corporations that are exploiting the Amazon in their search for oil reserves. There's also forensic architecture and there are numerous explorations of ecocide and genocide committed by states and corporations including examples of petrochemical interests destroying the environments and social well-being of African-American communities living in the afterlife of slavery or of Palestinians subjected to chemical warfare within Israeli settler colonialism. There's also uh, another example, landscape as evidence, uh, artist as witness, the theatrical court case held in Delhi in India as part of a performance conceived by the theater director, uh, Zuleika Chadari and Koj International Artists Association, which put extractive corporations on trial for destroying ecosystems in India and the life chances of communities who depend on those ecosystems for their survival. As the testimony of artists, including Navjad Altaf, Ravi Agarwal, and Sheba, uh, Sheba Chachi uh, showed. There's also um, Jonas Stahl and Radha D'Souza's Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes, another public tribunal to hold perpetrators of socio-environmental violence accountable uh, and to model a process that might one day have actual legal force. And lastly, although there's many more examples, um, there's Jumana Mana's uh, Wild Relatives, a film that investigates the saving of seeds in Syria's conflict zone during the recent civil war, differentiating between the homogenized varieties of corporate agribusiness that dominate nature and those seeds, so-called wild relatives that are more resilient in, diver uh, in diverse and changing climates and saved traditionally by small scale subsistence farmers living with nature. Uh, as these examples show, and particularly those that collaborate with indigenous communities, earth learning must avoid perpetuating the learning that has separated ourselves as multi-species assemblages called human uh, from 
the earth that we're learning from. For earth is a site of relationality that includes us within the web of life. Uh, and we humans, as we know, are composed of human cells that make up only about 43% of the body's total cell count, the rest being micros microscopic uh, symbionts, uh, including bacteria, viruses, fungi, and archaea, uh, as is shown in, in uh, paintings like this by Wang Gechi Mutu. So we must continue to learn from the earth that is in us. Uh, and those of us who want to learn from the earth must then unlearn our separation from the earth, a separation that's the source of historical and present forms of anthropocentrism that persist into contemporary society and its dominant economic regimes that, reg that relegate the earth as a source of exploitation, economic value accumulation, and a place of pollution and waste. It's what many indigenous peoples, uh, including for instance, the Zapatistas, term uh, right relations, meaning understanding our inseparability from earthly being and living according to ethical relations of mutuality, synergy, and co-belonging with the surrounding environment and web of life in which we are a part. For instance, in this painting by Beatrice Aurora, she shows the Zapatista community in the midst of a cornfield. Um, it's as if they themselves are corn um, as they identify as earth beings along with their um, um, botanical uh, relatives. So this, this is a, an, a way of imaging uh, what uh, many indigenous communities call right relations. So the, the most important component uh, in this earthly learning or relearning, depending on one's perspective and life experience, is, I want to argue, the unlearning of the forms of socio-environmental violence that threatens right relations and collective earthly survival. To learn from the earth, we must unlearn ecocide. That begins with understanding the causality behind ecocide, why and how it occurs, which when understood clearly, enables the challenging of that causality and opens up ways, including political ways and artistic ways to struggle for other forms of learning. For me, uh, ecocide is at the nexus of multiple forces of socio-environmental violence. And I say socio-environmental because this violence is simultaneously social, in involving intra-human forms of oppression and hierarchy, including along the lines of race, class, and gender. And it's environmental, involving forms of oppression and violence directed at the earth, at ecosystems, at the more than human realm, at its air, water, soil, and interconnected biogeophysical realm. That nexus of socio-environmental violence is, I'm convinced, rooted in racial and colonial capitalism and its long history. I believe that there are further oppressions, including, for instance, patriarchy, queer phobia, Islamophobia, ableism, and still others, which require additional analysis and are not unrelated to the others, but broadly speaking, the dominant causality behind climate chaos can be attributed to racial and colonial capitalism. Um, and this is just uh, an example of um, one uh, uh, resistant uh, formation within the movement for black lives that's attempting to tie in um, breathability, uh, in other words, environmental justice in relationship to breathing, two forms of social violence, including police brutality. Uh, so it's just, it's one example of a movement, of a social movement that clearly sees that we have to connect social to environmental violence. There's no way to pull these apart. Um, capitalism, uh, we know from such Marxist and eco-socialist analysis, describes the fundamental logic that prioritizes the production of value and its unequal ac accumulation above all else, just as it practices the systematic devaluation of both the labor and the natural resources on which it depends. This is not a choice of bad actors, but rather a structural operating principle that's fundamental to capitalism's laws of motion, which compel submission. These laws of motion mean that short-term profits will be prioritized above all else, including justice, compassion, 
and ecological well-being. That's the reason why ecosystems have been systematically destroyed over the course of modernity. Why carbon emissions are still growing today when the reality of climate emergency is a matter of global scientific consensus and why it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism as Frederick Jameson uh, said long ago. So I think campaigns like this one by the Progressive International targeting Amazon and to make Amazon pay in the name of uh, labor rights um, and environmental justice. This is crucial and a great example of what environmental justice um, as an anti-capitalist movement looks like today. As Hadas Thier explains uh, in her overview of the dominant political economy in this book, uh, she writes, capitalism is not designed to meet human need. It's designed to generate profit. That means not only robbing workers of our humanity and life, uh, but also the soil, the air, the planet. Not surprisingly, global climate governance, long guided by fossil capital's market-based logic, fails on this basis, which is evident in more than three decades of UN climate summits that have achieved basically nothing. Uh, these have consistently agreed member states' non-binding national contributions to emissions reductions, even as atmospheric carbon levels have steadily grown and continue to expand over some three decades of this form of global climate governance. We know that uh, this is not surprising given ongoing governmental support for fossil capital. For instance, G20 member states gifted fossil fuel companies $3 trillion in subsistence since 2015 alone. So capitalism will never be able to solve the problems of capitalism in the interests of capitalism, to put it simply. Uh, more like scholars uh, such as Andreas Malm and the Zedkin Collective argue in their recent book, White Skin, Black Fuel, capitalist interests have long drawn on white supremacy to manifest support for fossil fuels. For instance, equating the combustion engine as a source of economic and racial superiority, whether in relation to the steam powered boats and trains of colonial conquest or the automobile as emblem of freedom and racial privilege. And they continue to do so today uh, where what Malm and the Zedkin Collective call fossil fascism merge with Islamophobia and anti-migrant xenophobia in the service of economic nationalism and energy security. Capitalism is never not racial, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore has said, with racial capitalism being, in her words, a mode of production developed in agriculture, improved by enclosure in the old world and captive land and labor in the Americas, perfected in slavery's time motion, field factory choreography. It's imperative forged on the anvils of imperial war making monarchs. Considering that history and its ongoing operations in contemporary life, in mass incarcerated labor, the financialization of housing, the digital racism of surveillance capitalism, uh, which is viewed from the double perspectives of the black radical tradition and black Marxism. Uh, Charisse Berdnastelli offers an apt, this definition of racial capitalism, uh, where she writes, it's a racially hierarchical political economy constituting war and militarism, imperialist accumulation, expropriation by domination and labor ex super exploitation, where super exploitation results from the conjuncture of white supremacy, racialization, and the badge of slavery, which exacerbates the conditions of exploitation to which white working classes are subjected. Um, similarly, capitalism is inherently colonial, as Glenn Coulthard argues in this book, Redskin White Masks, such that uh, as he says, any strategy geared toward authentic decolonization must directly confront more than mere economic relations, he explains. And it has to account for the multifarious ways in which capitalism, patriarchy, white supremacy, and the totalizing character of state power interact with one another 
to form the constellation of power relations that sustain colonial patterns of behavior, structures, and relationships. He suggests that shifting our, analysis, our attention to the colonial frame is one way to facilitate this form of radical intersectionalist analysis. So these radical traditions of eco-socialism, the black radical tradition and indigenous decolonization show how racial and colonial capitalism is at the root of socio-environmental violence, the kind we witness in the land grabs of anti-indigenous ranching and fossil fuel prospecting, for instance, in Amazonia, or the corporate extractivism uh, for metals and rare earth materials in Odisha in India, uh, or the palm oil plantations set up on deforested lands in uh, Indonesia, um, and in the uh, DRC, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, uh, and in the environmental injustice of situating hazardous waste next to black communities in the US. Uh, for instance, that's uh, shown in this uh, documentary film, Mossville, where you see uh, this guy, Stacy Ryan's fenced in property in the midst of this uh, redistricted uh, petroscape um, of oil corporations and refineries that have gradually bought up land surrounding his house in which in what was once a, a thriving um, uh, black community in, uh, in the States in Louisiana. Um, they help explain also the ongoing conditions of extractivism, the violent dispossession of indigenous peoples and the sovereign debt impoverishment of countries suffering ongoing financial exploitation like in Puerto Rico and Haiti. As much as they explain associated conditions of climate refugees and racialized border control uh, by militarized policing, this being at the US southern border with Mexico um, and the way the US militarized border police uh, commonly use tear gas uh, against um, asylum seekers and refugees that are in need, often escaping conditions in their own countries like Honduras that have suffered decades of US imperialism uh, and the destruction of conditions of livability within their own countries. Um, this also includes the dislocation of urban workers owing to the speculative commodification of housing and, of course, the fossil capitalist colonization of our lands, water, and atmosphere in order to secure seemingly endless profits amidst extreme economic inequality that some today are calling neo-feudalism. So the radical intersectionalist analysis that Glenn Coulthard calls for is what I term ecology as intersectionality. Uh, this in a, um, an essay from a few years ago that lays out the, the theoretical um, uh, model um, that that refers to. This is the methodology of connecting the dots between biogeophysical processes commonly referred to as climatological, environmental, or ecological on the one hand, and on the other, the sociopolitical, the technological, and economic modes that are inextricably enmeshed with the natural. Climate is never then simply a matter of atmospheric carbon, in other words, for it strikes with differential force, hitting vulnerable communities of the politically dispossessed and economically impoverished the hardest. As a consequence, uh, we can argue that climate justice is social justice, is economic justice, is racial justice, is decolonial justice, is Earth justice, or as Sharice burden Stelly suggests, the necessary resolve of racial capitalism is socialism, a system broadly understood that prioritizes fulfilling the needs of people instead of the economic profits of the few. So unlearning ecocide is akin, I think, to what Ariella Azule calls unlearning imperialism in her recent book, Potential History. That unlearning means undoing the hierarchical procedures and inequality producing methodologies of what she, what she terms differential sovereignty uh, that makes uh, perpetrators of us all in regime made disasters and their multiple forms of violence. Certainly climate breakdown is a regime made disaster. 
Uh, it occurs from this unlearning imperialism. It occurs from the position of a citizen, necessarily a citizen perpetrator, who is committed to the task of reclaiming a non-differential worldly form of co-citizenship situated in a shared world in need of repair. Furthermore, claiming the right not to be made a perpetrator is, was, and should be, she writes, a constitutive right of any political formation and a guarantor of a substantial form of reparations. This unlearning, Azule explains, is necessarily done with companions who are not experts or guardians of knowledge, with whom one can collectively rehearse the withdrawal from and forgetting of imperial regimes of neoliberalism and financial capitalism, imperial historiography and its divisions of time and space, imperial theory and uh, politics, free trade treaties and privatization. That's a really short synopsis of what unlearning imperialism means for uh, Azule. I'm in agreement with uh, Azule's proposal for unlearning, including its important acknowledgement that insofar as we're all subjects of differential sovereignty, we're all implicated and complicit in forms of political violence to different degrees, depending on our positionality. I also agree with the necessary collective component of the unlearning. But where I depart is from the seeming perpetuation of the individual decisionist political consciousness that seems to be at work in Azale's model of unlearning, as when she prompts the reader throughout the book to imagine experts in the world of art, admitting that the entire project of artistic salvation to which they pledged allegiance is insane and that it could not have existed without exercising various forms of violence. Or when she says, imagine photographers refraining from going to conflict zones, not fueling the endless thirsty corporations with more images. Or when she says, imagine historians refusing to use their expertise and knowledge until the precedents used to justify injustice are replaced with worldly and non-imperial rights. Or when she says, imagine going on strike until our world is repaired. For me, this suggests a kind of uh, a notion of a priori subjective agency that is all too liberal and appears separate from the forming of consciousness in collective struggle wherein the subject bridges the gap between activity and consciousness. In other words, where politicization takes place, what one should ask motivates struggle in the first place and the desire for unlearning. Uh, a materialist analysis shows that it's sparked and becomes real through the lived experience of violence, oppression and, and inequality and injustice and is further materialized through resistance. It's not the consciousness of men that determines their reality, as Marx said long ago, but rather their social reality that determines their consciousness. My sense is that political consciousness is tied to the sense of one's material interests, which may also include the wider interests of one's community with all of its emotional and psychological attachments. Uh, expanded as well to that community's environment, which is also connected to the viability of its futurity, its, end, its, uh, its living endlessness. If political consciousness is non-individualist and formed in and of uh, a social process, born uh, often, but not necessarily only, in the lived experience of oppression and manifested and shaped in collective struggle, then the seeming volunteerism, self-possessed individualism and monadic imagination expressed in the phrase, imagine striking, appears unconvincing, at least less so than viewing the process of politicization as directly attached to the experiential threat of ongoing and imminent socio-environmental violence against the earth, against a livable climate, against our social well-being, our healthcare, our education, against the shared practices of life's reproduction, and the shared collective desire to stop it, 
which is signaled, for instance, in the title of another book, uh, Climate Change is Class War. While class consciousness is a longstanding problem for political theory, and there's no definitive answer to solve it, uh, I'm willing to accept the basic premise that it's not something that's ready-made or easily produced, but rather has to be organized. In other words, as the cause and consequence of collective struggle sourced in the knowledge of shared material interests and the awareness of that we're better off together acting in solidarity. When we organize, we move from being companions to being comrades. So I'm trying to suggest here the necessity of moving from um, a political theory of transformation based in imagination to one that's based in organization and, uh, and struggle. Getting to the point of committing to the unlearning of the racial and colonial capitalist causality behind climate change, which is the basic premise of unlearning ecocide, is no easy thing. Many of us has, have internalized fossil capitalist subjectivity because to live our lives, we have no choice. Or if we do, we accept that market-based approaches to climate mitigation, such as cap and trade or carbon offset markets or geoengineering will provide a solution, which is not surprising given that our political and media systems, those of the ruling class basically represent uh, ruling class ideas. That hegemony of common sense motivated by political and media elites who benefit financially from fossil fuel energy systems and their related racial and colonial implications, what Azule calls differential sovereignty, continue to rule the day. The only way to challenge this system is, I want to argue, to organize a majoritarian political opposition capable of challenging fossil capitalism. That means unlearning our complacency within arts institutional enclosure within the walls of fossil capitalism. As the movement behind uh, Strike MoMA shows, this is the ongoing struggle um, against uh, the toxic philanthropy and um, corporate ruling class interests at the heart of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. As this struggle shows, the ruling interests of our dominant art institutions are fully enmeshed within the logic of the dominant economy, its financial firms, its venture capitalists, those who commodify debt, profit from military weapon sales, support private prisons and police forces and commercialized media. Recognizing this reality means acknowledging our fundamental shared interests in opposing racial colonial oppression and opposing the fossil capitalist class fraction that is perpetrating it. A recognition that's at the basis of and what needs to be a majoritarian politics of life. So those of us opposed to this system can't remain complacent about limiting our energy to the production an, exhibit, an exhibition of art within the privatized enclosures of art institutions. Rather, we must organize, become part of collectives, organizations, and movements in order to build the political power to stop the destructive progress of fossil capital. Unlearning ecocide then means committing to the material practice of dismantling systems that perpetuate it. That means organizing and committing to long-term struggle. The far right has spent decades organizing to take over our political institutions and those of our arts, media, culture, technology, labor, education, agriculture, and healthcare. That's no, there's no shortcut to winning the world we want other than organizing and building the power necessary to take it back. I see positive examples of this approach to organizing in the artistic practices I cited earlier. For instance, in making her film, Wild Relatives, Jumana Mana connected with migrant women working in agricultural labor in Syria to learn of their experiences of social hardship and displacement and crisis amidst a longstanding drought and civil war, comparing their experiences to the displacement of seeds within agribusiness, thereby opening up connections and solidarity between critical art practice and labor organizing. 
and Stahl and D'Souza's Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes included testimony from multiple social and environmental justice organizations based in the global South, such as the Center for Research on Multinational Corporations, uh, Manchester International Law Center, Kenya Land Alliance, OU Togloi Watch in Mongolia, the Amazon Indigenous Communities United in Defense of their territories, National Synergy of Farmers and River Folks of Cameroon, and Friends of the Earth Indonesia, and more, all bringing critical exposure to corporations like ING, Unilever, and the Dutch state in perpetrating climate crimes, which was in some ways similar to Chadari's uh, Landscape as Evidence, Artist as Witness, where artist interviews, you can see Ravi Agarwal on the stand in this image, uh, made co connections between their artwork and the plight of indigenous and subsistence farmer communities in India, opening up further paths of political consciousness raising and solidarity. Uh, this just a few years before the largest strike in recent history, that's the farmers protest movement in India, which manifested uh, millions of people in opposition to uh, Narendra Modi's uh, neoliberal structural reform proposals, which was um, success, they were successfully overturned. There's also Imani Jacqueline Brown's project with Forensic Architecture on environmental racism in Death Alley, Louisiana, which was conducted again in collaboration with groups like the Center for Constitutional Rights, the Center for International Environmental Law, the Descendants Art Project, sorry, the Descendants Project, uh, Earthworks, Louisiana Bucket Brigade, and the Human Rights Advocacy project. Um, and, and in other words, the project was an amazing organizing initiative of alliance building uh, with these um, various organizations. And finally, uh, Biman and Tavares's Forest Law opens a portal between international art exhibition visitors, students, and the museum going public. And Sarayaku indigenous resistance to extractive oil corporations and the Ecuadorian state wreaking havoc in Amazonia. They included an interview with Nina Pakari, who's a constitutional lawyer uh, based in Ecuador, which is really important um, addition to the, the film project. Okay, so in conclusion, if art has any role to play in the in imagining of worlds beyond capitalist growth, unlearning ecocide and the learning from the earth, then its ambitions I'm arguing, must expand beyond the captured realms of institutional enclosure where speculation becomes marketed as depoliticized liberal freedom and luxury consumer goods. Any radical position articulated in a work of art must connect with movement building beyond ruling class institutions. Thinking, thinking growth beyond capitalism, in other words, entails not only a radical artistic imagination in conceptualizing radical futures, but also doing the actual work now of labor organizing and social movement empowerment in abolishing the growth obsessed capitalist economy, including the dominant art systems economy and participating everywhere in the building of multiracial working class solidarity with an eco-socialist horizon. Um, okay, that's all I have, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, TJ. This was really inspiring, very thought-provoking, and very, very rich. Um, do we have questions from, from the audience already? We also have an eye on our chat, right? On our uh, YouTube stream, Charles, uh, probably? Oh, very good. Okay, very good. You let me know. Do, do we have already questions? And unless we... We have. I, I can go. I can uh, ask ask the first one. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, again, really, really thought provoking. Um, um, on the most basic level, uh, you know, I wonder how how could we as uh, artists and scholars perhaps together? Uh, what should I do? The host had to give it your video to start. Okay, so remind video start. Huh? Now you see me. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> on the most basic level, my question um, as a scholar, on the most basic level, how could we as artists and scholars together 
uh, and a pass perhaps address those issues of climate justice, uh, which you claim as beautifully kind of and convincingly claim as social justice, right? Earth justice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how can we collectively, you quoted here, Ariela uh, Azulal, which I find really inspiring as well, her book, how could we collectively rehearse um, uh, this unlearning also with those who are most perhaps directly, uh, you know, affected, the migrants, uh, the poor, uh, the displaced. Um, so how can we not only, so to say, go on strike, perhaps you could speak a little bit about, you know, practical examples as well, a little bit of inspiration also for what will be going on here and what is going on here um, in our Safinta. Um, yeah. Sure, thanks for that question. Um, it's, uh, that's the big challenge, I think. Um, certainly we can do work within our, um, our professions and activities, whatever they are, whether it's as an artist or as a scholar or as a writer, certainly like um, this is the kind of material that I'm teaching about um, in uh, University of California at Santa Cruz where I'm based, or when I get, give lectures and uh, presentations like this, um, this is the stuff I think that is uh, most important to be thinking about, talking about and um, engaging in uh, activity uh, in relationship to all this stuff. Uh, so certainly there's tons of stuff we can do in relationship to that, whether it's making artwork that addresses these topics, that sheds new light on them from a variety of different perspectives and methodologies. Um, I offer just a small sample of some of those. And certainly we can try to struggle within the university, uh, for instance, as is happening at my university, uh, to get um, environmental and climate justice um, better uh, recognized um, and legitimated within the curriculum. So students are learning about this stuff. Um, but at a certain point, uh, and it, even though all that is very important, I think at a certain point, we have to stop being uh, artists and scholars, um, at least agreeing to um, the kind of imposed individuated identities uh, that are demanded of us within um, the marketplace, uh, within the job market, uh, within artistic institutions, within the museums and, uh, and universities. There's such a pressure to be uh, individualized and to act as a kind of self-entrepreneur of ideas. Uh, we all know this in different ways. Um, and I think that's something that Azule is trying to get at in, in, in her work. Um, also that uh, people like Matt Huber in Climate Change's Class War is also trying to recognize. Certainly Andreas Malm and the Zedkin Collective are addressing this as well. Uh, at a certain point, you know, we have to move beyond the imposition of neoliberal individuated identities mm -hmm. and collectivize. Um, many indigenous traditions in this phrase right relations would say that the, that the, that the composition of collectivization also uh, cannot be simply human. It has to be taking on a more than human solidarity with the more than human realm. Um, and so collectivization has to be post-anthropocentric. I think this is, this is the kind of work that we need to do. Uh, as an example, for instance, for me, um, I've increasingly re realized that it's really important to act locally. Um, and so in Santa Cruz, that means being part of a social movement organization. Um, for me in Santa Cruz, the leading organization that I have the best um, um, you know, kind of solidarity with is uh, DSA, that's the Democratic Socialists of America. And they have, they're doing a lot of work with eco-socialism and addressing local conditions of uh, decarbonization, electrification, public transportation, uh, social and racial justice, um, services for houseless people, uh, mutual aid for those in need, uh, fighting for environmental justice in relationship to drought and uh, catastrophic wildfires. So, you know, this, this is possible, I'm, I'm sure, 
where, wherever anyone is. And if it doesn't already exist, then it's up to us to start it, to generate it, to create organizations and build those collectives. I think this is really crucial. This is what the far right is doing. They're organizing as we speak. Uh, we're living in emergency times. Um, it's indeed uh, extremely uh, daunting and threatening. Um, I see no other way to address this than as a kind of um, universal ethical political imperative to get involved in doing, like dedicating, ourse dedicating ourselves to saving the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, yes, very, very inspiring. I wonder also, um, TJ, is there a way in which, you know, contemporary institutions can be engaged in this, also this large institutions? I'm thinking also here, you know, perhaps uh, founding bodies and uh, policy makers, um, how can they approach uh, these problems in a more, in a kind of most effective way? Um, I think there, there it gets more difficult because um, funding bodies and institutions, um, especially larger scale institutions are dependent on uh, ultimately the fossil capitalist economy. Mm -hmm. Fossil capitalism is a term that Andreas Malm uh, uses, which I, I think um, uh, appropriately captures the kind of domination of, um, of governance uh, worldwide these days. So when we're dealing with museums, for instance, or universities that are tied into say state or private funding, often that funding is tied directly into uh, fossil fuel uh, interests and um, fossil fuel economies. And so this is where, for instance, I think divestment campaigns become really important. Uh, we're dealing with this now um, in, uh, at my university. This is like a, a global project of divestment. Lots of uh, museums and institutions have declared climate emergencies and have um, uh, committed themselves to uh, gradual decarbonization. Um, so that, however, is a really complex proposal because uh, for one, what does decarbonization mean? Often it, it means committing to um, other kind of problematic market-based solutions like carbon offsetting, for instance. Um, and it also raises the prospect of uh, if we divest from fossil fuels, what are we investing in? What kind of world are we building with divestment and reinvestment? Um, what we're facing these days is the threat uh, some would say of green capitalism, where decarbonization is driving a new kind of extractivism. Um, for instance, in countries like uh, Bolivia, trying to go after lithium reserves in order to build batteries for electrification for electric vehicles and solar panels and stuff like that. So how can we, um, again, bring together uh, climate justice with social justice? so that we don't allow uh, green capitalist decarbonization to turn into a kind of new green colonialism. Um, that's, that's, what that, that's the danger that I'm seeing in relationship to this. Um, there's also simply the fact that institutions pay lip service to decarbonization um, and social justice, but ultimately don't do anything about it. That's why I think uh, Azoulay's proposal about strikes and rethinking and recommitting to labor organize, organizing is really crucial because if there's any way to transform institutions, it's not ultimately, sadly, it's not ultimately through having pleasant convivial conversations with institutional leadership. Ultimately, I think it will come down to recognizing fundamental class antagonisms and transforming through the threat of withdrawing labor. So Azoulay's discussion of strikes I think is really important. We have to reevaluate what this means. We have to strike, I think, ultimately in favor of climate justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. I, I could go on and on, but perhaps there is a, yes, we have two questions. Um, shall, we, shall we take one from the audience and um, just please wait for the mic? TJ, you see just the one part of the audience we have on the, on this side, uh, another part. And, um, Hello, TJ. Yeah. Thank you for the lectures. It's very inspiring. 
of all the other side of the audio is so funny with us right now. Sorry, the, the, the audio is really blurred. I can't really um, understand. Or, or should I, should I pause it? That's so pretty. Yes, please. Hello, TJ. Can you hear me clear? Okay. Uh, th thank you for the lecture. Uh, super inspiring. I have a quick question uh, because you were talking about this sort of uh, surveillance uh, capitalism and also this kind of discrimination in terms of technology. So my question will be more focused on the uh, technosphere in terms of how we can, how, how we relate the technology to the, uh, to the ecology or how we relate technology to the way we understand the earth and environment. Um, as we are developing more and more um, kind of advanced technologies such as uh, the crypto currency or um, artificial intelligence, which be more specific machine learning, which is leading to things we don't, uh, we cannot foresee so clearly. And also, for example, the metaverse, which you know, um, Mark Zuckerberg was trying to promote. And how do you think we should understand this sort of technology? Because they are bringing a lot of uncertainties and a lot of risk. Um, because you were just showing this Amazon case um, about about you know Amazon should pay back because one of the reason um, Amazon got a lot of profits during the COVID was because uh, we are relying on the internet more and more. Like we are relying on, for example, right now we are relying on the Zoom, which is making a huge amount of profit for the AWS. So how should we try to understand um, these sort of unforeseeable technology um, in terms of either criticism or try to build a new uh, structure or try to somehow um, somehow try to frame that into a current knowledge system. I would like to hear how you kind of um, think about this, this problem. Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent question. Um, and it's, um, it's no, nothing easy or simple to answer really quickly, right? Because it's, it's really complicated. Um, but I, I think you're right. I like the direction of where you're trying to take this. Um, those are all crucial questions. Um, my own thinking about this is that, um, uh, yeah, absolutely, we have to think about technology and AI futures. Um, and I think without uh, slipping into a kind of uh, post democratic what I see as a post-democratic temptation on behalf of, uh, of some people who are thinking about this these days. Uh, for instance, I'll, I'll mention the, uh, the Strelka Institute in Moscow um, has been talking about terraforming and uh, addressing ecological emergency through uh, AI futures and automation. Uh, and that we need to do that urgently, even if it means uh, solving technological problems of climate change in advance of democratic problems of climate change or technology. So I think the risk of putting technology before democracy uh, is an invitation to a kind of fascist future or a totalitarian or authoritarian post-democratic future. So I think the question of how we relate to and can mobilize technology uh, in a way that is dedicated to social justice and democratic participation is really crucial. Um, a couple resources that I found here. One is um, there's some thinking, for instance, uh, by uh, one person, Dan McQuillan at Goldsmiths in London, who who's um, uh, working on the question of what, what does an anti-fascist AI look like? Uh, what would it mean to, in other words, in, uh, you know, uh, merge, um, uh, artificial intelligence with democratic um, uh, and human participation. Uh, so I think this is really important to think about uh, so that we don't give ourselves over in our systems to greater domination um, through technology or what Naomi Klein calls the Screen New Deal, right? She, she was writing during the pandemic and the fact that corporations are, are just making a killing through the virtualization of experience during the pandemic shutdown. 
Uh, she calls it the screen New Deal. Uh, not green, but, but screen, like screen-based media. Uh, there's also someone working at, uh, at MIT in the States, uh, Joy Bulamwini, and she ha- she's created what, what she calls the Algorithmic Justice League. Uh, this is really fascinating in terms of thinking about um, like the unconscious bias and institutional racism that is sometimes often included within uh, facial recognition software. Uh, so she's trying to not oppose technology, but how can we have like a justice-based methodology for using uh, technology? I think these are also crucial questions. And then finally, uh, Amazon. Um, I like, I very much like this project by uh, Jonas Stahl called Collectivize Amazon. Uh, and he's arguing that, and others as well, um, that these social media companies have become so necessary to contemporary life. It's, in, it's reached a point where it's really inconceivable to exist without them. At that point, really, we should have public, uh, you, they should, social media companies and Amazon, uh, these kind of dominant global corporations should ultimately uh, be akin to public utilities. These should serve the public uh, and not private interests. So I think this is a real, this is a real um, important intervention. Um, I think also I, we haven't gotten, I haven't gotten into this at all, but of course, um, Asia and China in particular is an enormous player at the present and in the near future in relationship to this nexus of technology, um, AI, and surveillance and governmentality. Um, and we have to think about um, like where that's going and how we can contribute to a kind of democratization of Chinese, China's, China's version of socialism um, as it uh, hopefully will move away from a kind of authoritarian hierarchical uh, capitalism. I, I, that's, I know that's way too sim- simple to say very quickly, but those are, that's stuff I'm thinking about these days. Thank you. Very inspiring. Because um, just to add one more sentence, because I think um, the current attitude about, how, for example, just using surveillance technology as in as a term, um, I think tr- you know, trying to think about how to um, how to how to kind of um, make it more like a democratic kind of agency, right? I think that's something we we should try to think about because neither. You know, for example, what China is doing or giving a total rejection of using using the facial recognition technology is not the solution. Because on the other hand, if we just refuse the technology, we are losing a lot of data, which might benefit, you know, to on another term. So I think um, what you're also the reference you're giving are very, very helpful for, for us to understand this issue. Thanks. Thank you again. Yes, um, we have one uh, question that uh, comes in via WhatsApp from, from uh, Guido Tanti, who is actually an excellent urologist, not a person of, um, of profession uh, or of, uh, of kind of, not an art historian or someone who is very um, exactly engaged in these topics, but he, as he says, excellent talk. He couldn't join us uh, in person. Perhaps he will join us tomorrow. Um, He says, um, a very personal question he has, how do you manage to live in the States in these days with this precise non-diplomatic racial, uh, radical, sorry, radical, non-diplomatic radical thoughts? Um, You know, life is a continual struggle. And uh, in the States, we're in a very dangerous uh, political situation, I think where we've already suffered through uh, one administration by uh, someone that people are commonly and increasingly referring to as fascist. Um, And this is no longer, you know, extremist alarmist language. This is accurate, an accurate diagnosis of political conditions that are post-democratic and moving increasingly toward authoritarianism in the States. Um, and I know, you know, 
other people, including African Americans and indigenous people, would be quick to point out that the US, the United States, was founded right, in conditions of indigenous genocide and anti-Black slavery, um, extremely patriarchal, basically a republic of property owning white men. So this is nothing completely new, um, but you know, the kind of history of struggle in the states dedicated to civil rights, to feminism, uh, to anti-racism, more recently, uh, LGBTQ rights, trans rights, and so on. This is all in jeopardy today with the near future of uh, increased repression, white supremacy and political authoritarianism and warfare, militarism. The US's relation to militarism um, is, you know, I think unbounded. Uh, and so that makes living in the US very difficult when you don't agree with that uh, philosophy, with that with that worldview. Um, and I live for I, I lived and worked in London for ten years, so I've lived outside of the country as well. But uh, returning to the states and living here, I, I think for me, like you know, what can we do except to organize and try to shift the discourse, change the politics? Uh, su support movements for social justice and democracy. Uh, and I don't know, like that's what I'm trying to do. And it, it indeed is not easy. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a continual kind of existential challenge. Um, and of course, like it's much worse for people who don't have the privileges that I do. Um, but I think it's really important to uh, be in solidarity uh, and develop that kind of collective opposition um, to challenge this. And you know, even if things are getting worse, there's no choice for me but to continue to fight it. Mm -hmm. It's just. I think it's almost an amazing note to end up. But we have another question from the audience. Would you like to uh, come to the call? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, thank you very much. I just wanted to add actually to the reading list, uh, the latest publication of Bu Jung Shul Han, Digitization and the Crisis of Democracy. It has just been translated, came out last year in German. I've just looked up, it's now in English as well. It's in and actually addresses this sort of threat to democracy through algorithms. Um, and it's so thin, you can recommend it to your students to read as well. Um, but what I'm, I'm living in England and uh, what I've noticed is the internalization of injustices within the working class. And uh, uh, there was a very interesting, very small film in German TV during the Jubilee of the Queen. And uh, it was in German TV. And it pointed out that the hierarchical structure within the United Kingdom um, is almost so in, well, it's so inherited that the dispossessed working classes of the north of England, where I live, which looks probably a bit like Detroit, have internalized the injustices so much that there is actually no recognition that it is not an injustice given by birth. So I think your kind of uh, positive thinking in relation to socialist ideas uh, within the European context has two problems. One is that we are uh, 30 years since the reunification of Germany and uh, not so socialist socialism experienced by my uh, family or by parts of the family. And then you have the other extreme within um, the so-called oldest democracy within Europe um, in inverted commas, where social injustice is totally internalized. Um, and uh, in the hyper individualized uh, capitalist structure internalized to 
uh, disease levels of mental health crises. So I think I think um, so. The sort of idea of um, uh, mobilizing, I think, yes, we have to keep believing we can mobilize. Otherwise, we might as well hang ourselves. But I think the the, the conditions are very encrusted, um, and um, the the class uh, gulf is is uh, almost well, it's not almost it is inherited. Uh, 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 to kind of realize in neighborhoods in which I live that people live in housing conditions which are, you know, 1950s um, and think this is the only thing they deserve, I think. And, and, and their children also being taught that they don't deserve anything else. But, you know, unlearning that is a revolution. Absolutely. Thanks for that question. Yeah, thank you for that question. I've, I noted the um, the book Digitization and the Crisis of Democracy. I look forward to looking into that. Um, and yeah, absolutely. The, the point about how the um, like working people have internalized hierarchy and in a certain way uh, inferiority um, in other ways, attaching themselves to a kind of nationalist uh, supremacism or even racial superiority. Um, this dynamic is also similar to what's happened in the States, where the biggest, one of the biggest uh, political transformations has been uh, the move of the, um, the largely white working class to support Trumpism. Um, in other words, the working class, the multiracial working class rejection of Corbynism was similar to the U.S. multiracial working class rejection of uh, Bernie Sandersism. Um, so, how can we uh, address this and try to challenge it within the you know environmental politics a little bit more specifically? There's a long-standing divide between uh, environmentalists versus working class interests. And this is, I think, a, a false binary opposition uh, that's necessary to overcome. Like, how can we start to rethink our environmental politics um, as a form of um, like working class empowerment so that we're not faced continually with this rhetorical challenge of jobs versus the environment. Because as many know, you know, we can't have any jobs without a world to live in. So there's, I think at least in the States and probably in the UK to some degree, there's, there's and also in Europe, there's, a, there's at least the beginnings of a transformation uh, of uh, social movements that are trying to again, bring together um, a politics of life with a working class base. And that means overcoming immense internalizations of uh, working class populations, of a kind of um, inheritance of inferiority or an acceptance of the naturalness of hierarchy or the naturalness of capitalism. Uh, in conjunction with the idea that there is no alternative, right? That Thatcheristic um, uh, slogan. This is like deeply ideological and hegemonic. So I agree with that acknowledgement. Um, and I see that as the challenge as well. I, I think that we're, if anything, we're moving in the wrong direction still globally. Um, and I think it's important to take note of uh, developments in the global south, for instance, what's been happening in places like Chile, in Colombia, um, and also to pay more attention to Asia and uh, China in terms of alternate approaches to socialism and uh, a social justice-based environmentalism, even if they're uneven and mixed at times with authoritarian tendencies. Nonetheless, um, I see no other option than to continue to push for uh, a systemic critique of, um, of capitalism and socialism as the necessary resolve 
even if that means confronting um, deep histories of lived experience of a kind of, um, uh, you know, dictatorial Stalinism that unfortunately has um, completely dominated the discussion of what socialism can be within the European context. Uh, but that's really the challenge. I mean, we're, we're at the, at the, um, at the cusp of a you know, kind of a capitalist world destruction. Um, not even communism did that. So I think we have to somehow get beyond this barrier and continue to draw on resources um, of socialist ecology um, that have really powerful uh, traditions that get suppressed within dominant capitalist education and uh, uh, media formations and politics. But um, ultimately, yeah, that's part of the challenge. So, you know, it's, it's a, mine, my, uh, my viewpoint is, is very mixed in terms of um, a kind of pessimistic optimism. I think this Gramscian formulation of uh, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will uh, could not be more relevant today. Thank you, TJ. We are running slightly over time, but if you allow and everyone still um, uh, can stay with us here in the room, I would love to follow up with uh, another question from actually one of our participants in the Arts Earth Academy, um, Anna Rosia um, Haberman. Um, she's uh, an architect and very interested in the issues that you uh, that you mentioned. He says, um, thank you for the inspiring talk. I have a question that is uh, an attempt to connect the lecturer to the location when we are currently uh, in the Swiss Alps where uh, to me, ecocide seems at least at first sight to an outsider absent. Do you have tips how to relate um, and what to look for in an environment like this? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I'm not intimately familiar with this, with uh, Switzerland or the Swiss Alps, um, but from what I do know, um, there's a gradual uh, um, uh, disappearance of glaciers within the Swiss Alps that's reflective of global conditions of climate breakdown. This is, from my understanding, part of the, you know, the global catastrophe of climate disruption caused by ultimately um, atmospheric carbon and the fossil fuel economy. Uh, so I think that I would suspect that people in the Swiss, Swiss Alps are, are very familiar with and concerned with uh, glacier melt uh, and the way it's transforming ecosystems um, along with wider conditions of drought and rainfall disruption and species habitat fragmentation and disruption. So I think like those, I would argue, need to be connected to these larger conditions that are worldwide, that are driving uh, climate transformation. And again, that would be the conditions of fossil capitalism. And the fact that don't, like a relatively small number of corporations, it's like 80 or 100, are largely responsible for climate transformation. And our global politicians, we know, are invested financially and structurally within the conditions of fossil capitalism. And that's the reason why nothing has changed politically. So what can we do about melting glaciers in the Swiss Alps? I think it's the same, we have to connect the dots, we have to develop the same kind of systemic structural analysis. And commit ourselves to doing the work of organizing, to transform politics as we know it, so that we can stop the causality behind catastrophic climate breakdown. Thank you. Yes, and we have also really interesting artists in our wider networks that are engaged in those topics. Um, so it's, it's great to kind of connect the story. Uh, TJ, I can't help but ask just one very practical question because you and I and many uh, of, of, of the participants here are uh, um, kind of you know engaged in teaching, and uh, you mentioned pedagogy as an active agent uh, in uh, in this change. And I wonder whether in your uh, center for creative uh, ecologies 
or, or you know, through your teaching at uh, University of California, um, uh, uh, Santa Cruz, sorry, <laughs> whether you have specific methods um, to approach um, these problems, you know, as, as a pedagogical projects uh, with the students, whether you could give us something on the way, us who teach or who, you know, who uh, engage with those problems of the mediation of knowledge uh, every day. And now the, the topic is different, obviously, than, you know, giving lectures like this, which are very important, but just engaging uh, the students in perhaps alternative pedagogies. Yeah, it's, it's really crucial to, I, I think, um, to, to see students as um, in a way, you know, active agents of their own learning. Um, and so that means there's limits to uh, lectures and readings, you know, filling their brains with information. Really, they have to come to these questions themselves, develop their own strategies for how to be, um, you know, an agent of, uh, of education and, and, tra and political transformation. So I think, you know, beyond lectures and seminars and discussions, um, I think it's, you know, through more informal activities can be really helpful in um, uh, encouraging um, the sharing of agency. And that could be, for instance, like a, a kind of a, a collective uh, walk. Like we do a lot of um, walking uh, in order to, like walk together and think together in relationship to environmental conditions. So that could be, you know, encouraging people to notice, for instance, how uh, the environment is um, social and political in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, we're dealing with a lot with uh, gentrification and housing commodification. So how do, you know, trees and uh, the, the river system in, in Santa Cruz how do bushes, how do they divide communities? How do they create proper, private property lines? Mm -hmm. uh, how, are, how is the environment uh, exploited in relationship to houselessness, you know, weaponized against people uh, who are claimed to be you know, destroying the environment? Um, or how can we take field trips? Uh, we live, we're, we're a coastal city, so the, the, the Pacific Ocean is really important. Um, how can we learn about uh, the, the maritime environment, uh, ex as well as extractivism and, and threats of oil drill, offshore oil drilling in the Pacific? Um, there's some local or, or regional uh, oil wells in California. So we, we you know, I talked, sometimes we, we, we've taken field trips where we visit these sites. Um, and it's more, you know, really informal, uh, where it's ultimately up to them how they want to react and experience this. But I think that's ultimately the necessary beginning mm -hmm. of uh, you know, this development of, uh, of agency, of learning from the earth uh, and um, like political awareness. It, it's like it crystallizes in those moments where students learn that they're not simply students. They're also stakeholders and agents uh, in this larger, um, um, you know, momentous challenge that we're all facing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. I think we, you know, we have learned so much from you. We are really excited uh, about these processes of learning and unlearning, and we'll continue doing so over the next two days, hopefully. But let me just um, invite everyone joining me to just thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. <laughs> Thank you so much also for wonderful questions to everyone here and to everyone that joined us uh, online. Um, yes, we hope to stay in touch and uh, please stay with us for the next uh, two days, TJ. Thank you very much. Thanks for all the excellent questions as well. Really appreciate it.